let me just start with the question that we all dread. The question, what do you do? It can stump and paralyze even the most successful business person. There's this notion, well, instinctively, we want to answer the question with what we are. I am a teacher. I am a doctor. I am a stay-at-home mom. I am a contractor. The problem, though, is that salespeople feel like that ends quickly the conversation. It stops the conversation because of preconceived notions about what we are and what that means and what that does. So the trouble is that salespeople are encouraging us, especially those of us who sell a service or who solve complex problems for others or those who lead a cause, they're telling us that we should have a prepared elevator speech. Something where in say 30 to 45 seconds, we can recite what it is that we do. And we can make a clear case for why somebody should be involved with us when we do it. The difficulty is that this is a great struggle. Have any of you tried to create your elevator speech? And if you have, you've learned that it's really hard to come up with something that sounds truly compelling. People that have an elevator speech, when we're asked, what do you do, we still stop and we say, oh man, we think in our head this internal dialogue, I hope I can relay this well, I hope that it's effective. If we don't have an elevator speech, we think when someone asks us what we do, we answer with what we are, and then we think, I really didn't use that opportunity very well to put myself out there and create a sense of what it is that I can do for that person. So we kind of kick ourselves a little bit afterwards. So what's supposed to happen when we use this elevator speech? Something really magical is supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is, say you're a teacher and someone asks you what you do. You're supposed to illustrate uh, or answer with something like, I change the world one child at a time. And the person is supposed to say, wow, that's so interesting. Please, please tell me more. I'm dying to hear. And that really rarely ever happens. What usually happens, that's a noble cause, a noble purpose, teaching, right? When somebody smells that you might be working up to selling something, they're absolutely not going to want to invite a sales pitch. In fact, the reason that they asked you what you do is usually just out of politeness in the first place. Yet we persist in this notion that if we tell somebody something about what we do, that we can do it in a way that's really meaningful to them and that's welcome. And it's really not. Do you know what this actually is? This is actually in-person spam. <laughs> it's not something that we invite. We're barraging people with our commercials. We're interrupting their day. We're giving them information that maybe in another situation could be of interest to them or of context, but we don't know yet. It's premature. We're delivering information in a way that is irrelevant to them. What the elevator pitch does, I believe, is it epitomizes what's wrong with marketing today, especially in the non-product world. What it does is it tries to emulate product marketing. Product marketing is all about features and benefits. It's all about saying what something can do for you to the mass market. Think about commercials, television commercials, and how they appeal to the mass market. In fact, they're so irrelevant to most people that what they seek to do is entertain you so that even if you don't need what it is that they're doing, hopefully the commercial will be memorable enough to you that you'll recall it later should that need ever arise. So when we do what we do in a way that solves complex problems for people, we need to really appeal to them through rapport. We need to earn their trust so that they'll listen to us and maybe take heed of our words and care enough about what we're going to say about how to help them. So where does this start? To be taken seriously, a record, uh, sorry, a rehearsed message is never going to get us there. In fact, unless we hobnob with famous people, or we do something that really is changing the world in a compelling way, no one is waiting with bated breath to hear more about what it is that we do. Just like, just like the flat answer of what we are ends the conversation abruptly, the preconceived notions will kick in at this point and um, the stereotypes will kick in at this point, and people will shut down and say, you know, I don't need that, like the commercial, right? I don't need that. I already have it. That's good. I know what it is. And you'll get an answer that says something like, okay, that's nice, and the conversation halts. 
So the elevator speech is based on a string of events that start with you sitting in your office, back in your room, and creating, crafting this thing that's about you and about what you want to say to just about anyone, not to anyone specific. It's just to anyone in general. And the problem with this is that we need to really ditch the elevator speech and make the message more relevant to the individual that we're talking to. We need to invert this, and I'm going to show you how. First, we need to stop taking bad advice from sales gurus who tell us that we should emulate the product marketing world, because that's probably not what we do. We need to stop broadcasting impersonally. And face-to-face -face broadcasting is even worse. But this also applies to social media. If you're a social media user, you don't want to be broadcasting um, you know, blanketly to mass market uh, through social channels. That would put you in the same light as this. We need to be relating and we need to be connecting to people. We need to know and we need to think about what it is that we're actually trying to do in our careers. And when we contact other new people, when you network after this event, what is it that you're trying to accomplish by meeting new people? You're trying to show them that you can help them. And you're trying to show them that you might have some answers and some ideas for them, for their complex problems. There's a really ancient art, ancient practices that take us back to a way to teach people and to enlighten them about new things, things that they didn't know. That ancient art, if you think back to it, is storytelling. Humans have always done really well with stories. Stories are these beautiful packages or containers that house nuances uh, and, and complicated messages. And they teach lessons, and they illustrate results. And they bring us to solutions in a creative way. Stories that we hear and stories that we tell cast a light on who we are. They cast a light on our values and on our beliefs. They can show the nature of our character. They can show if we're um, if we're if if we're funny or we're we're you know dull or dry, they can show if we're confident or if we're tentative. They can expose what we're most passionate about, but most importantly, above all, they humanize us. So by inverting the path that I showed you by, before, by starting with the person that you're talking to, you can get to a point where you're crafting a really relevant message on the spot. Right? You're crafting a really relevant message that meets their needs and answers their story. So we're going to seek to exchange stories with people instead of giving a strict, straight elevator pitch. And you might be thinking, how do we decide what stories to tell someone? It's not easy. If we're thinking about it in advance, we might have a couple of favorite stories about results that we can deliver or what have you. But we really need to think about what stories to tell you, this person, at this specific time. And that's quite a challenge. The key is to start with them. Who are they? So when someone asks you what you do, you want to turn the conversation around fairly quickly and find out more about what they do so that you can make your responses and your answers relevant to them. Each of us take a path in our life. We've each followed a journey to get us to where we are today. The journey has twists and turns and nuances. Most of us that started in our careers didn't start by doing what it is that we're doing today. And when you learn somebody else's journey and somebody else's path, it's laced with clues about who they are. And it gives you opportunities to see where your paths intersect over the course of the years. So that when you talk to them, you have new associations. We're all used to using social connectors when we talk to people, when we meet someone new. Maybe it's, do we both have children? Are our children about the same age? Do we have grandchildren? Did we grow up in the same area? Do we follow the same sports teams? We look naturally for social connectors because that's a nice, safe place to be. But what we're really talking about here is developing business or finding people to follow our cause. And so what we need to do is focus more on the business side. And we're looking for the business connectors. So I'm going to show you five questions that help you get people to share their business path with you so you can find ways to relate to them along those lines. I want you to think of marketing as a facilitated conversation where you're asking the right questions to invoke responses that are meaningful to the person and meaningful to you. It's multifaceted. The first question to ask isn't, what do you do? Because we know that can be a little bit off-putting and a little intimidating because of what we've discussed. The best first question is, where do you work? 
You might get a geographical response to that, so you can dig a little bit deeper. But where do you work is a much more interesting question to ask because people will then start to tell you a little bit about their company. The next question to ask is what inspired you to go into that? And if inspired feels a little touchy-feely, you can say, how did you end up doing what it is that you're doing? The next one, it takes you to a very positive place. What do you like about what you do? And that one makes you think in a happy spot. And when people are happy, they associate that happiness with you. But what do you like most about what you do? The next question is, what, is what was whatever it is that they do like when you started? What was that like when you started doing that? A reflective question is really powerful. And this is a complicated question because it's also a comparing question. When you get somebody to think back and compare what something was like then with how something is now, they're digging deeper. And when people dig deeper, journalists will tell you this, there's much more thought going on about, wow, this person's kind of inspiring. This person makes me think, and I like that. People like to think, and they like to think that you're that interested in them. So this is a really powerful question. And lastly, how do you approach something about what you're doing now? We want to bring them back to the present. And often, you can have heard in the first questions clues that will help you ask, how do you approach something now? And they'll unearth different complexities or problems or issues that they're dealing with. So that when you're talking back with them later with your stories, you can be relevant to these issues. So focusing on not interjecting, really nodding and smiling and encouraging more answers is an important place to be in this conversation. Open-ended questions are also the best. Thoughtful follow-on questions are also excellent. But realize that after a certain point in time, you've asked so many questions that the person is going to probably realize, I've been talking too long. Maybe I should reciprocate. And that's great. That's what you want them to do, because then they'll invite you to tell your stories. And if they don't invite you to tell your stories, you can still bridge the gap um, kind of the same way that you, that you would otherwise move the conversation along. And that would be by saying something like, I find it really interesting that you and insert something common, a commonality between you there. And then you can follow that with, similarly, I have. Now, you're not trying to one-up them here, so you don't want to throw something like that in there. But you're just trying to lead, to show where those paths have intersected over the years, to lead them down your path a little bit, too. So by relating and tying your stories together, you're actually helping them a great deal to have the context to see how they relate to you in the past and in the future. And there's one other piece that's really important that I want to leave you with. When you help people, you have a different level of connection than you could ever have just by talking with them. So when you have this opportunity to interface with people, think about maybe two other ways that you could potentially help them. One is by introducing them to someone you know already, where there would be a mutually beneficial relationship, where the two people could get more out of working together or knowing each other than simply by knowing you. You're helping two people in that process, and you're deepening the relationship. So offer to introduce them to somebody and tell them why. I think you really should meet this person. That would be really good for both of you. Another way to help them is to offer to send them something, not something marketing or sales related, but something really informational and something related to a place that they've been in their past. By asking their permission to send them something, either something that you've read or something that you've written, you're getting their permission to stay connected. And no elevator speech is going to take you to that level. So I want to leave you with this. What can we take away from the ancient ritual of storytelling? Stories are purposeful. Like elevator speeches, stories are performances in a way. But that's all that the two have in common. Storytellers grip us, and they invite us in. Their stories are always for us. Their stories are not for them. That's really important when you think about the what's in it for me. They're, before they begin, the storyteller always understands their audience. And they begin to understand what their audience needs to hear. So effective marketing doesn't come from broadcasting. It comes from relating. Forget canned messages. Forget pitches. Just seek to connect through exchanging stories and find ways to stay connected. Thank you.